Hey, hey, Tony guys are here. <clears throat> now, one of the things that a lot of people have talked about and really don't think about and pay attention to is really what it takes. I, I noticed that there is a lot of delusion with women not understanding how or what it takes for a man to be faithful in a relationship. And I want to help give some keys to this because I read today, I seen a young lady say there's no good way to pick a, a, a good father for your child. And that's 100% false. <laughs> it's 100% false. And, and the reason why it's false is because people do not equate a man's actions and his choices with his character. So you got to really think about this thing and, and really use common sense. And so think about this. If a man smokes, if he smokes, what does that mean? That means that he has thought about his lungs and he has thought about his esophagus and he has thought about his pores. He has thought about the smell. He has thought about his teeth, his tongue, his clothes, the walls in his home. He has thought about these things and he has thought about cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, and he has decided to smoke regardless of all of those things. He has seen examples of even men who just were known for smoking marijuana, like Bob Marley. I'm, I'm, me and my wife are supposed to go watch his movie tonight. He was known for smoking marijuana, yet he still died. A young death from cancer or something of the sort and was just known for marijuana. And they have made him the face of marijuana and getting high. Did he want to be that? I doubt it. Probably want to be known for his music more so. He's known for his music. But a lot of people try to just associate him with smoking. And yet they have seen many men smoke and die. And not one man can say, hey. Smoking cigarettes or smoking marijuana or smoking whatever has helped me live past 100 or even helped me live past 90. Although there probably have been some men who have done that. But a lot of women will look at that and not think that it has any implications to the man's character. A man who gets drunk every day or every week. What had what is he saying? He's saying that he has thought about liver disease. He has thought about kidney disease. He has thought about drunk driving crashes and all the people who have lost their life driving drunk. He has thought about all of these things and yet and still he still gets drunk over and over and over again. A lot of women will see that and not think that it has anything to do with can a man be faithful or not. <clears throat> a man who does not believe in God or does not have or he believes in God, but he doesn't try to live for God. What does that mean? That means that he doesn't fear a higher power. He doesn't fear the known creator. So the known creator holds your eternity in his hands and he does not fear that. He does not fear his creator having power in or over his life. So if he doesn't fear his creator, if he doesn't respect his creator, how much more likely is he to respect a woman? If he cannot believe in God, then how much more likely is he to believe in a woman and a woman's ability to be faithful to him if he does not believe in the omnipotent, omnipresent, everlasting God? If this man 
chooses not to believe in God or not to fear and reverence God, when millions of other men, including myself, fear and reverence God, what type of ego does that man have to say that myself and millions of other men are dummies, idiots, weak, lost, broken, confused because we believe in God. So if a man has that type of rebellious spirit and that type of mindset, how can a woman think that an atheist can be faithful to her if he does not fear or nor can he be faithful to a higher power, a creator. But yet there will be women and there will be atheist men who say they are 100% faithful and both are 100% a lie. I 100% guarantee it. And the only reason why a man will be faithful is because he just cannot cheat. He does not have the money to pay a woman or he does not have the looks or the body or the ability to get a woman without paying that or his thing does not work. And that would be the only way that he would be able to be faithful for his life for the rest of his life. So what does it take for a man to be faithful? One and one thing only, and that is character. But character is comprised of several things. Character is comprised of many things. So you have to look at the man's lifestyle and his choices and what he chooses to put into his body, what he chooses to watch with his eyes, what he chooses to listen to with his ears and what he chooses to do. And then you have to take your risk assessment because this is what you have to understand is for a man, when a man has sex with a woman, he's taking some risk. So if a man is going to cheat on a woman, he has thought about the possibility of getting caught. He has thought about the possibility of the woman he's with going off. He's thought about the possibility of the woman he cheats with going off going crazy. He's thought about the woman who he cheats with having a boyfriend or a friend with benefits or a situationship or a husband and that man coming after him to take his life. He has thought about catching an STD. He has thought about getting the woman pregnant and the woman refusing to terminate the pregnancy and him having an outside baby. So he has thought about all of these things and yet still he chooses to cheat, to, to have sex with this woman or even if it's not cheating, even if it's just like fornicating and he's single. So this is what I'm saying is you have to have your own risk assessment system and risk is risk. Somebody put the quote in the comments the other day that said how you do one thing is how you do everything, something like that. That's not all the way true, but for the most part it is because it's, you might clean your body, but you might not have, your, your room might not be as clean as your body. You might not clean your car, but you clean your room. You might, you might not smoke, but you curse, or you might cut corners on your coworkers, but you don't cut corners on your kids. So it's not all the way true of how you do one thing is how you do everything solely because we care differently about different things. So we don't do everything the same. We don't give everything the same amount of energy, but we get what, what the author of the quote is trying to say. And it most likely was talked about inside of one area. It most likely was talked about like how you do one thing in your marriage is how you do everything or how you do one thing on your job is how you do everything and not intent, not intended to cross over from work to home or associates to children or what have you. 
but it does apply to a degree. And so you have to think about this. Okay, if this man is willing to take this risk, let's say a man gambles, okay? He has thought about losing his money. He has thought about gambling addiction. He has thought about losing everything. He has thought about putting different property or cars or whatever up to gamble. He has thought about being robbed after being after a big win at the casino. I saw this guy the other day leaving the casino with like five. I was at the casino because they have a spa there and my wife was there at the spa getting a uh, a facial and a massage and because it says one of the nicest uh, spas in the city. So I'm sitting outside in the parking lot because it's hard to sit in the casino because there's so much smoke in there. And so I'm sitting outside in the parking lot and this man walking to the parking lot with like six duffel bags. <laughs> I'm like, is these his, I don't know if these are his clothes or if these bags are money. I wanted to rob them. Well, I sure came close. I was like, man, I just want to just, man, I wish I had my little gun, just stick them up real quick. So I see the thing because I used to be a criminal. I still have little flashbacks. I was not no armed robber now, but I still have little flashbacks of fast money, little criminal activity. That's something to think about when you meet a man. If he sells drugs, he has thought about losing his life. He has thought about being robbed. He has thought about going to prison. He has thought about taking a life. He has thought about doing life in prison. He has thought about the death penalty like he and he has decided he's going to risk his freedom risk his life to sell drugs so put this all together put this all together and this is how you evaluate this man so i would say now it would be a stretch to say if a man curses he will cheat because cursing really has no other impl implications other than maybe it inciting more anger or more foolishness or more violence, but it really has really no other implications or unless it makes you feel a little defiled or something in your spirit. So that would be a little drastic. But when you think about the vices, and so this is when you meet a man, you have to put his vices on a scale. And this is where women go wrong. The woman say, oh, you can't choose no the, the right baby daddy. It's no safe way to choose the right baby daddy. And although that is not 100% false, there there is a risk assessment in place. So if you're choosing your baby daddy, meaning the man you're going to have kids with, you got to say, okay, does he smoke? Does he drink? Does he curse? Does he watch porn? Does he gamble? Does he do illegal activity? Is he nice to people? How does he treat waitresses and customer service? Does he break laws? Like, does he speed all the time? Like, ridiculously going 100 miles an hour, you know, in a 60 or 55? Like all of these things is implications. So a woman might get in a car with a man and he break, he, he doing U-turn where it's a no U-turn. He going 20, 30, 40 miles over the speed limit. This is telling you about him because if this man will go 40 miles over the speed limit, 30 miles over the speed limit and weaving in and out of traffic, he could fly off the highway. He could be wrapped around a tree. So if a man will take that type of risk, then what makes a woman think he won't put his thing in a condom and have sex with another woman? That's far less risky than going 100 miles an hour when the speed limit is 65. That's far less risky to, 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 a, man, to a man at least. Because he's he's saying, oh, I'm preventing babies and I'm preventing STDs. 
He's not thinking about the spiritually transmitted diseases, but he's thinking about the sexually transmitted ones. So I'm tell you right now, it's way less risky to a man to have some eh, some good old uh, versus dry. And, and as I think about it, I'm like, man, <laughs> this is funny now. But when I became a faithful man, I also started driving the speed limit. <laughs> it's it, it's crazy. That I think about that. Like, I don't get drunk. I don't smoke. I don't curse. I drive the speed limit. I don't gamble. And I don't watch porn. And I'm faithful. But it's like when I was an unfaithful man. When I was a womanizer, I broke the law. I was a criminal. I sold drugs. You know, I was a thief. I, I ain't gamble because I ain't have money, but I wasn't against gambling. I didn't smoke only just because I saw smoking as a gateway drug to being a crackhead. Um, I, I didn't drink only because I was an athlete, but then I, I later, you know, would drink, but I didn't get drunk just because I just don't really like the taste of alcohol. So, but it wasn't like I was against the stuff, but it was like, and then I would speed, I would break all the laws that I could break, and I was willing, I was risking my freedom, I was risking my life, I was 100% willing to take a life, I was all the way out there, but guess what I also was? A liar, a cheater, a manipulator, and a deceiver. So this is what I try to help women get to understand, but so many women argue with me. And so many men argue with me because they got to argue with me in the comments because they know that behind closed doors, their choices that they make in public also correlate to the choices they make when nobody looking. So it'll be highly unlikely for a man to risk his health, cut his life short, risk his like risk his lungs, risk his esophagus risk his eyesight, risk all of this stuff with what he's putting into his body and then all of a sudden have a conscience about watching porn and masturbating. Huh? R really? Come on now. Who, who we fooling? Who we fooling? If you will get high, you will cheat. But it's so many women, it's a lot of women that do not believe that because you're not just getting high. You're also cutting your life short. You're altering your brain chemistry. You, I used to sell weed. It is a drug. It changes everybody who uses it. Nobody smokes weed and stays the same person. It is a drug. It alters your brain chemistry. It changes you. Whether you could see it or not, whether you could feel it or not, I could see it because I was your pusher. I was your supplier who never once in my life took a puff of weed. If I sold weed and I sold the highest level, the highest grade of it, the one that looked like Christmas trees with little Christmas lights on it is, is what it looked like, what we call dro. It didn't smell stank like no skunk. To me, it smelled almost like an air freshener like a forest air freshener, and it, it, it looked so good you could eat it, but I never once smoked it. What do that tell you? Because I was sitting outside looking in with a clear view. I'm the coach on the sideline. I could look and see how my homeboys' lives are being changed, how their brain chemistry is being changed how their mindset, the way they live, the way they move, the way they think is being changed from this drug called marijuana. But so many people are so delusional to it because they are in the grips of it. So if you can't see it when you in the grips of it, Albert Einstein say you cannot solve a problem from the same level of thinking that it was created with. Meaning you can't address it when you in it. You can't speak to it when you under its influence. When you need it every day, you are its slave. So you can't say what power it has and does not have because it's clearly showing you the power it has 
by making you think that you don't need it. But when you try to go without it, you start to get antsy and frustrated and fidgety and angry and mad and have withdrawals. So obviously that means you do need it. That means you do need it. And that means it is a drug. And that means it has control. You don't have control if you need it and it doesn't need you. You don't have control. So this is what I'm trying to help you understand. You have to evaluate the actions that are being taken. You have to evaluate the character. The only one that I don't feel comfortable putting a whole lot of stock in, the only vice or character flaw would be cursing. That would be the only one. But but guess what, though? I seen a man one time who was cursing. He's a cursor. And there was a beautiful woman around and he had his wedding ring hidden. His wedding ring was in his pocket. But when he seen me and he know what I stand on, I watched him pull his ring out of his pocket. He didn't think I was looking because I was talking to somebody else and he was talking to somebody else. And I watched him pull his ring out of his pocket and put it back on his ring finger. But the place that we were in, the building we was in, we had, it was some beautiful women that was there working. And, but yet this was a cursor. I don't know him to be a drinker or a smoker, just a cursor. But see, Zig Ziglar, her Zig Ziglar say, studies show that the more a man curses, the less sensitive he becomes to his behavior. So what does that mean? Sensitive to your behavior means that you are thoughtful and aware of how you are behaving, what you are doing. So even when you think about something as innocent and as small as cursing, what is it attached to? Do you curse in church? Is it okay and customary to curse in a church? Why not? Is it okay and customary to curse in a mosque? Why not? Is it okay and customary to curse in a temple? Why not? Is it okay and customary for school teachers to curse in a classroom? Why not? Because it is associated with the profane, with profanity. And where do you typically see it being used. If a comedian use, is using it, what is he also being? Vulgar. What is he also typically doing? Talking about something profane or vulgar. So he, his, his stand-up is laced with a bunch of curse words. If you see an athlete cursing, what is... What is that typically associated with? His anger or his frustration. So when you see cursing, it is typically associated with fear, get cut off in traffic, yell the F word. You're about to get hit, almost lose your life, you scream the F word, the S word. Fear, folly, which is also foolishness, fear, foolishness, frustration. So typically with curse words, look at its association. You don't typically have a curse word associated with joy and the joy be separate from folly or foolishness. So somebody may be super excited like to get an amazing gift, like get a brand new car as a gift, that may bring a curse word. As as the man said in the Malcolm X movie, what did he say? He said, he said a person curses 
because they lack the vocabulary to express what's on their mind. This was a Muslim teaching a convert about why they don't use curse words. Now, we don't see that to be true because now a lot of people are becoming Muslim. A lot of young black men are becoming Muslim and they curse like a sailor. They fornicating, they adulterating, but it's typically like rappers and athletes. That's because they becoming a Muslim because not because they want to be close to God or because they want to live righteous or sacred. A lot of the people today are doing it as a it's a fad. It's a trend. And they doing and they choosing Islam over Christianity because of the other people that they see in Islam making it look cool. And but Islam is still a religion that requires a lot of dedication and personal sacrifice. But a lot of the people that's converting to Islam today don't want to sacrifice or be personally dedicated to the belief system. They're doing it this for the same reason a lot of people are using the name of God and, and Christ. They're doing it for clout and to like be a part of this club and to look special or to look smart or to look deep or to look different or chosen or set apart, but they're not actually willing to live the lifestyle that the sacred text of their religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, whatever it is, they don't actually want to live the lifestyle that their text or their God instructs them to live. And these things, whether regardless of the religion that a person of a man chooses, these things are often overlooked by women. And what I notice is that women don't understand the implications. And we I touched on this other video, but I got to keep expounding upon it because I, I seen one lady. She was like, oh, Tony, I hear what you're saying, you know, but I disagree. It's not a difference between men and women. It's about our walk with God. Men and women, even of with God, still have different flaws and different shortcomings because we process information differently. We process reverence differently. We process respect differently. We process fear differently. Men and women are not the same. So the way a woman sins against God is not going to be the same as the way a man sins against God across the board. Yes, there will be women who sin against God by uh, fornicating. Just like there will be men who sin against God by fornicating. But a woman in fornication is in fornication typically, not, not across the board, but typically because she feels this is what the man wants and this is what the man needs and this is how she honors and worships this man. And she puts the man before God. So she's having sex, not because her body is in desperate need and craving for it, because as you'll know, and you, and when you poll a lot of husbands, our wives are not desperate for sex. You really, nine out of 10 husbands will tell you that we pretty much have to initiate that part of the relationship. We don't have to initiate the conversation. We don't have to initiate even like quality time or, or dates, but nine out of 10 husbands will tell you the man is the initiator. And then that one out of 10, which if you're a woman and you like to initiate sex, I'm going to ask you to be quiet because you're saying more about yourself than you should be. And, and you might think that's normal. It's absolutely not normal. It's absolutely not normal. And, and if you say you and your friends, you're telling us more about you and your friends because it's just it's not the norm. And some women try to say, oh, women want it just as bad as men. That's not true either. You telling on yourself and, and you probably want to keep that to yourself. Keep that between you and your husband. We don't need to know that online. The world don't need to know that, ma'am. And it ain't about shaming a woman who is sexual. It's just about the nature 
of man and woman is not the same. And the reason why it's not the same is because of the chemistry of the body that is connected with, that is without our choice. The reason why a woman does not desire sex as much as a man is because of the science, the biology of her body. When a woman has sex, the body is immediately preparing to conceive a child and carry a child for the next 10 months. So therefore, child carrying and childbirth is so very dangerous and draining on a woman's body that this act, the brain does not associate, the brain does not separate a woman having sex and having an orgasm from having a baby. The brain is wired for sex to produce a baby in a woman's body. Point blank period. This is this is hard wiring that a woman has no control over. You have to talk to God, the, the manufacturer, the creator. So a woman's body, when it has sex, the brain is preparing the body to carry a child. And that is why on average, women are not as sexually driven as men because of everything that a woman's body does for sex, because you have to think about how a woman's private area contracts and how it expands. You have to think about the science of the egg and the science of the uterus. You have to think about how the breasts are tied into the process and even the nipples, the nipples and the breast are tied into the process of sex and conceiving and carrying a child. So this is where it is inherently and biologically false that a woman wants sex just as much and more than a man. When you evaluate the women who say that, you will see there is an outlying reason why they want sex as much as a man. And you will also see that it is typically seasonal. And one of the things that you will find in most of those women, because every woman that has said that to me, I have evaluated her past and she was sexually abused as a child, whether it was by an older man or even by someone her age, but meaning she was exposed to the feeling of an orgasm at a very young age. And even though, and she felt that pulsating sensation and she felt the nerves of a clitoris being stimulated and that feeling gave her a release in her body. Her brain released the oxytocin, that bonding chemical. And from that feeling at such a young age before she knew what was happen happening biologically and scientifically, she began to unknowingly chase that feeling because that feeling gave her a sense of bonding and comfort in her toxic and dangerous environment. Because what you have to realize is a young lady that is able to be sexually assaulted means that she's not closely watched, means that she is left in places where she is unsafe meaning at a family member's house, at a friend's house, at her own house. So she is left in places where she is unsafe and where she can be victimized. And But although she is in a place where she can be victimized, when she has this stimulating feeling from her private area, that chemical from the brain is a feel-good sensation. So now this thing that is foreign to her also becomes comforting to her. And, and you heard the man express this. I think it was the workout guy, Sean T, express how when he was sexually assaulted as a, as a boy, I think it was by his father or stepfather, 
how he started to crave that feeling. And it's not just about wanting the love or the touch of that human. It's literally a chemical release from the brain. So the same part of the brain that is activated from drug usage, like cocaine, is the same part of the brain that's activated from that, that sexual stimulation chemical release. And science has proven this. It just happens in different strength levels, different doses, so to speak. And so listen, I learned this from studying humans, not studying just books and biology, but from studying humans and then trusting God to give me the wisdom to articulate it. So see, this is far deeper than a lot of people want to admit or understand. And this what on this YouTube university, we finna start going a little deeper and we finna really go on in and we finna really talk about this thing. So this is why you have to think about this. Now, understand this. When a man has an orgasm, you also have to think about the difference between the bodies. So a man can have an orgasm off a, like a million different ways. And when I say a million different ways, what I mean is a man can rub up against the bed. A man can rub up against a wall. A man can rub with his hand. A man can be in any type of insertion, meaning any type of insertion and have a release. A woman's body is far more complex. So if a man is inserted into a woman he's not attracted to, his member will still have a release. If a man is inserted into any type of thing that circumferences, circles, surrounds his member, he will have a release. It is not the same case for a woman. A woman's mind has to be attached to what she's doing. So in order for a woman to truly, she may have a sensation, but she has to be at to a certain degree in a state of relaxation or a state of not relaxation, but unaware or willingness or not knowing when I say unaware for that release to really take hold. And that, and what I mean by that is that is why women who have been violently taken advantage of, it's not an, an enjoyable experience. A woman who is tired and she doesn't feel like it. It's not an enjoyable experience. A woman who is angry, she's mad with her man. It's not an enjoyable experience. A woman has to be in agreement, in agreement with what her body is doing for her to truly enjoy that process. There may be exceptions to the rule, but we won't be able to pinpoint them easily. But that is why you see if a man, and that's what you'll hear husbands talking about and you'll hear wives talking about this, is if the wife has a headache and the husband coerces her, she's just like a dead fish and she doesn't want to be there and she doesn't get any pleasure or anything from it because she doesn't want to be there. Her mind is not in it. And that's why it is said that Scientifically, the largest sexual organ is the brain when the mind is in it. Now, this also applies to men, meaning if a man's mind is not in it, then he can have all of the same stimulation and everything and not have a release. So that is possible for a man. It's not as easy as it is for a woman, meaning it's not as easy for a man to not have a release as it is for a woman to not have a release because a woman could even be about to have a release. And if the motion or the area or the whatever changes, it will stop her release. And so 
that shows you that for a woman's body, it is it takes consistency. This also shows you the difference between men and women and the roles that we play in reproduction and the and the way that we view sex and the way that our bodies process sex, our brains process sex. So for a man, a man experiences in willing, consensual intercourse, a man experiences no, unless something weird happens, a man experiences no pain with the process of reproduction. reproduction. So as men, it is pleasurable, pleasurable from start to finish, from the conception of the child to the birth of the child. We do not, as men, we do not contract and have contractions when our woman has contractions. We do not have birth pains when our woman is having birth pains. We do not have monthly cycles. And then when our woman is pregnant, the cycle stops. We don't have monthly bleeding. We don't have back pain when our woman is pregnant. Some people say that and all that, but it's, it's not science. It's not, you know, we, we men don't feel what a woman feels. A woman is bearing that pain by herself. So therefore, the brain's association with sex for the man is a very positive and rewarding experience. The brain's association with sex for the woman is a very spiritual experience because her spirit is combining with a man's spirit to create a third spirit. You have to understand that when a woman conceives a child, that child will come out in human form, but that is a spirit. So the brain's association with sex in a woman is very spiritual. Whereas for a man, sex is very physical. Although it is spiritual, it's very physical. Now, when a man allows it to be spiritual, meaning when a man is connected emotionally and mentally to what he's doing sexually, sex goes a lot faster for a man. So if a man's mind is in it, we can have a release in the first second of entering a woman. If a man is immersed into it, if a man's mind is not in it, a man could actually go for as long as his blood flow allows that member to be fully engaged for as long as his healthy blood flow. So meaning an athlete who has a great blood flow and is in great shape and body is like a well-oiled machine, that athlete or whoever that's in shape, that person, that man that's in shape can go a lot longer time. And even after that man who is in shape has a release, because of the blood flow, still being able to flow to that member, that in shape person can continue to go a second, a third, a fourth. It's not that when the man has a release, it's done. That's about blood flow. So this is what women have to understand. And also what you have to think about. So what I'm saying is with a man's member, it is not connected to the brain like a woman's member is connected to the brain. Meaning it's connected to the brain, but the connection is nowhere near as sensitive and strong as a man. So as a woman. So here's what I'm saying is as a man, something can, I could take this book. And if I sit this book on my lap and I brush it across a few times, that member will react. I'm not attracted to that book. I don't want to do anything with that book. Now, this is this stuff that 90% of men cannot articulate because a lot of times we run from our thoughts and we run from ourselves and we don't express things. And this is why I have my sons talk and articulate and express their feelings and answer questions because the more you get to know yourself, the more you understand. So I could take this here book 
and I can rub this book a little while and that member will take and react because it react to that. And so this is why, this is why it is said by the old school women don't sit on a man lap. You know why the old school women realize that is because they have sat on their father's lap and felt something hard in his pants. That father is not attracted to his daughter, but depending on his blood flow, his thing can react without it, with no mental association to that. And depending on his, his health level and his blood flow, he will have to mentally tell himself, this is, this is my daughter, 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 for that thing not to react if she is sitting that high on his lap and rubbing across it. A dog could sit on his lap. A baby could sit on his lap. Anything, that's why that thing is not a part of a man. It's not to be touched. Now, when a man has no com when a man has no sexual association whatsoever to what is brushing up against his thing, he does have the mental power for it not to respond. He does have the mental power. But if he go to thinking about it too much, that thing may react because it is intended to work repeatedly. And the reason why it's intended to work repeatedly is because God created humans to replenish the earth. The, a man's job is to replenish the earth. So if that thing was not a fully loaded, highly loaded machine gun, we would not have 7 billion people on the planet. The reason why we have 7 billion people on the planet is because of how that thing work. That thing worked. And imagine how many people we would have if there were no miscarriages and there were no abortions. Imagine how, if there were no homicide, if there was no stillborns, if there was no premature deaths, imagine how many people would be on this planet. Do you have five o'clock traffic? Imagine five o'clock traffic if we did not have all of the, the losses that we, that we suffer as humans. Imagine your five o'clock traffic then. So you got to understand that this five o'clock traffic is from this thing shooting. And guess what? Most women only carrying one child at a time. That's how these things working. So this is what you have to understand. If something works this fast, this hard, this automated, this consistent, what does it take? What type, what level of discipline and self-control will it take for a man to contain and tame and control that thing? When it responds, like uh, if it is cold, that thing stand up. Like if it, if it is cold, if it is like anything, the body, like as a man, a lot of times, and, and I don't know how body, how woman body work, but as men, when our body get real tired, like if we get tired and we stand up late and our body start to kind of process, like go through that thing will get hard. Our body, when we wake up in the morning, when we wake up in the morning, a lot of times that thing will be rocked. Now, you have to ask yourself as a woman, does your body react and start to, you know, lubricate when you tired or is it fully lubricated when you wake up or if the wind blow, do you get lubricated? If if a baby sit on your lap, do you get lubricated? If a, a, a dog in your lap, do you get lubricated? That's why you see these men who don't have no type of character or mental control. I worked in a place where one of the men in there, he one of the things he did was sleep with cats. Sleep with cats, 
sleep with dogs. Like he literally could get turned on by his cat sitting in his lap, rubbing his cat. His thing would get stimulated and he would grab that cat, put them, put them four legs together. And he would pull his thing out and grab the cat legs really, really tight to where the cat can't go nowhere and try to insert himself in that cat. And he had claw marks down his thighs. And he had did this with a either a cow or a horse or a dog. And this was in his program. It was in, he was he was slow. Um he had a mental issue. And it could have been because his father, it could have been because his mother probably was his, his, his aunt as his aunt. A lot of these guys I worked with, they, they mom was their aunt. I mean, they, they dad sister or they dad daughter. And so they had, you know, when the genes too close like that, some it could cause oh, oh, the wiring be off. This very real. This very real now. And so that's what so what I'm saying is did I'm telling stuff on here that men take to their grave. And, and it's a lot of men that are coming to comments because they have not because this don't happen to them and they don't they, they haven't worked with men like I work with. They haven't studied men. They they don't study humans. They don't study human behavior. They they do construction. Or they do IT or they so this sounds absolutely crazy to them because they're not a human scientist. I'm a human scientist. I study humans. You can't you can't talk like I'm talking for an hour breaking this stuff down if you don't have the data. If you don't study humans. And and ironically, although I do it as a professional, I've been doing this since a child. Because I was a, I was quiet. I was about to say a mute. I could talk, but I didn't say a word. I studied people. And that's why when I have my coaching sessions, somebody could show me their picture and I could tell them everything about themselves. Because I was able to learn based on how you look, how the world treats you. And based on how the world treats you, what it did to your personality. So I can look at a woman's picture and I would tell her all about herself. And she would say, Tony, that is me 100%. How can you tell that by a picture? It's because I'm a human scientist. I study people. If you quiet enough and you pay enough attention, you start to see patterns. And that's why I try to tell y'all, stay out my doggone comments with exceptions to the rule. That is what's understood does not need to be explained. We understand that you may be an exception to the rule. We understand that there are exceptions to the rule. That is not what theories and laws are based on. Theories, which then become laws, are based on the majority of the test performed, the results from the test performed. We have a hypothesis. We test the hypothesis. Then based on the results, we then are able to develop our laws, our theories and our laws. So we understand that there are exceptions. That's not what this is about. And this is what ignorant people don't understand. And this is how your ignorance gets you hurt. It's because you see an exception and then you make the exception the rule. And so then you move through life and you go into your next relationship and you are considering you are thinking this person is going to be another exception 
but based on the numbers, they are more likely to be a part of the majority, a part of the rule than they are to be a part of the exception. But you have your guards and your heart wired for an exception and they turn out to be the rule and that's how you get hurt. You have to assume that this is the rule and leave room for the exception to be proved. That is how you protect yourself. Here's what I am saying. Let me make it plain for you. Let me make it a little more plain for you, okay? You have to lock your doors in a neighborhood with high crime. And then if you are not robbed in the years that you live there, the exception has been proven to you, to your household. It doesn't mean your neighbor didn't get robbed. Don't mean the person on this side didn't get robbed. It just means you didn't get robbed. But if you are in a neighborhood with a high crime, that lets you know the rule of this neighborhood is crime. If you don't experience crime, that doesn't mean you live in a safe neighborhood. That means you are the exception to the rule. Let me put it into a sexual context. The rule is if you have unprotected sex with multiple people, you are going to contract an STD or conceive a baby or both. If you sleep with multiple people and a child is never con conceived and you do not catch an STD, you are not the rule. The exception has been proved. This is what I need you to understand. So the rule is the more risk that a man is willing to take with his life, with his health, the more likely he is to take the risk of cheating on his woman. It does not mean that every man who smokes will cheat. It does not mean that every man who drinks will cheat. It does not mean that every man who gambles will cheat. What it means is he is more likely to cheat. On the flip side, it does not mean that a man who does not drink, does not smoke, and does not gamble will be faithful because the easiest thing for a man to do is to have sex. Sex for a man is easier than risking your kidneys, risking your esophagus, risking your lungs, or risking your savings and all your money. Sex is easier than risking all of those things. A man will take the risk of sex far beyond he will take the risk of any other aspect of his life because he is not wired to gamble. He is not wired to smoke. He is not wired to drink. Those things come from societal pressure. The only thing a man is wired to do is to desire a woman. Society does not have to pressure a man to want a woman. Society does not have to pressure a man to want a woman. He has to experience societal or peer pressure to become a smoker, to become a drinker, to become a gambler, to become a cursor. The one thing that even a monk will desire is a woman. And he has to train himself to have self-control. These are the rules. These are the exceptions. Don't confuse the two. So yes, a man who has vices, 
can be faithful, but he will be an exception to the rule. A man who has no vices can be a cheater, but he will be an exception to the rule. This Tony Gaxon, my wife just texted me. I got to go. God bless you.